<laughs> okay, right. So this this amazing book is called uh, With the End in Mind. And as you can see, it's I've got I've scribbled bits in it and all sorts. Um, but when I came across this particular part, I just thought I have to read it and but I have to say that <laughs> as I've read it through, there have been so many different times where I thought, oh, I need to read that or I need to read that. Anyway, I'm going to read you this. Are you ready? So I'm going to, re I'm going to read a bit and then I'm going to go on to the next page, which uh, so I'm missing quite a bit out, but then it will make sense. By evening, it was clear that her burdens laid down. Nana was preparing to die. A visitor from her nursing home a diminutive and very experienced nursing nun spotted the signs and asked her where she wanted to spend her last days. No beating about the bush, Nana wanted to get home and the knee-high nun said they would expect her home tomorrow. The ward staff agreed to make the transfer arrangements. Nana smiled and slept and slipped into a coma. All things I have seen many, many times, time, many, many times. Times, yet never really seen at all. And that is how I came to come to be perched on the edge of this chair in the darkness, searching the face and the sounds of my frail and failing grandmother. Suddenly she opens her eyes and says, you should be not here, asleep. Almost a sensible sentence. I touch her cheek and notice that her nose is cool at the tip. Nana, you have walked the floor at night for all of us. Now it's your, our turn, just sleep. I'm comfy here and it's lovely to be with you. And she smiles a gummy benediction of a smile that brings tears to my eyes. Mum and auntie have gone for a cup of tea. They'll be back soon. Can I get you anything? She shakes her head and closes her eyes. From out of nowhere, the sound of Brahms lullaby floats into my mind. It's halting wolf's time reinterpreted as a bedtime lullaby sung to each of her 13 grandchildren in our turn, and probably to our parents before us too. In Nana's deep, cracked yet soothing voice, here at the edge of her dying, I contemplate the meagre understanding I have of her long and often troubled life, and the intimate knowledge that she has of mine. She is a remarkable woman. The next 20 minutes pass in this way before mum and auntie reappear with a paper cup of orange hospital tea for me. Oh, I remember those ho horrible orange cups of tea. I feel as though I have been alone here for an eternity, watching and evaluating my comatose grandmother, searching for meanings and discarding them again. We are past the point of communicating. The loss weighs like a heavy stone in my chest. I offer to stay the night, but auntie will not hear of it. The night shift is hers, and tomorrow I have a long journey back to my small children and my busy job and my kind husband. I know that I will not see Nana again. In fact, getting home perked Nana up immediately, immensely, and we did see her the next weekend, propped up on pillows, pale and diminished, yet delighted to see us all. Between long snoozes, she enjoyed at short conversations. I was not there when she gave out her last breath the following week, but I had learned the lesson of the vigil. And through the kindness of the natural order, watching a grandparent's death. Since then, there have been many other vigils with the same intensity of active watching and exhausting focus, and with sadness at the untimeliness of deaths before their right time, as though there is a right time but also with recognition and appreciation of the last lesson I learned at my grandmother's knee. I'm so glad you chose that. Thank you. It was a great learning experience because I think we all think we know because we see things. Yes. And then suddenly we're not watching somebody else. We're we are in it, we are in the bedside chair as the relative. Yeah. And it feels completely different. And it changed the way I was able to sympathize with families who came to say, I'm sure my dad's groaning, come and listen to this noise. And I was sure she was trying to speak with one half of my head 
while the other half of my head was saying, you've seen this hundreds of times. This is unconscious breathing. She is not speaking. She's breathing through a closed throat. Is she? Isn't she? Yeah. So it's made, it made me a kinder doctor. Yeah. I, I, I knew that when I read it. Yeah. I, I, knew, I knew that. So I have read from Julie's book. Now I want to show you Julie's book because one of the things that's gorgeous <laughs> about Julie's book is it's teeny tiny. It's a coffee table book and it's made so that, you know, when you don't know what to say, it's a gift. It's a, it's a gift you could give to somebody at the beginning of grieving or any point in grieving really. And it's a combination of Julie's experiences in working with people who are grieving and her own experiences. But it also includes some really wonderful advice about looking after ourselves. And, and Julie's first book um, talks about seeing our life as a path through a garden and how we need to recognize who are the flowers in our garden, the things that are precious to us, the people who, who nurture us, and we have to water ourselves as well. And this book picks up that message. And so it's the message to me as a reader or you, if you are reading it, that I'm going to read. So a little bit from the introduction, and then I'm going to take you to the end of the book. In my first book, I introduced you to the analogy of life being like a garden. Just like the plants in a garden, we all need to be nourished in order to survive and thrive. I therefore use keep watering you, a phrase I use to remind people of the need to look after themselves in order to be happy and healthy. There's then a really lovely series of stories of different sorts of loss. And one of the things I'm really glad to see in here is it's not just loss of spouse or loss of child or loss of friend, it includes loss of pet. Those really, really important things because none of us can say whose loss is the greatest for a person other than ourself. And then towards the end, Julie comes back to the self-care that we need. I'm now going to share with you a hugely valuable exercise to help you discover your own good grief garden path. Following the few simple, simple steps below will help you to survive the grieving process and eventually reach the end of the path and flourish again in the sunshine. Get some pens and paper to the ready and get to work. Right, I'm not expecting you all to have pens and paper, but I do want you to get <laughs> to work. So, exercise your well-being watering can. I would like you to imagine a watering can. This watering can represents you. I would like you to estimate on a scale of one to a hundred how full your watering can is right now. By this, I mean in terms of how much energy you have and how you're feeling. For example, Julie says, as I write this, I reckon my can is approximately 80% full. So this is Julie on a good day. <laughs> so part one is to draw a watering can on a large piece of paper. So you just imagine you're gonna draw a watering can. Nobody's gonna criticize your drawing. You're going to draw a watering can. Don't worry about your artistic skills, she says. This is purely for you to be able to imagine a watering can and relate it to how you're feeling. Next, colour the can into the level that is at, at this very moment giving you a visual picture of how full it is now. You will know by looking at the can if your energy level, how well you're feeling, needs to be increased. And now you're ready to complete the next part of the exercise. So I did. Oh. So, so here's my watering can. And as you can see, it's nearly full because I did this on a good day as well. So part two, when I'm talking about watering you, I'm referring to the things that you need physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I want you to think about each of these four things. What do I need physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? Next, on the same or a new piece of paper, start jotting down the things you need to answer each of those questions. 
they can be very basic things. For example, in answer to the first question about what you need physically, you might write food and drink. Next, I'd like you to begin expanding on that. What kind of food and drink? What do you like or need to eat and drink? What makes you feel good? And quite often a different answer, what does your body need in terms of vitamins, fiber, protein, etc.? Answers to the other questions might include exercise, love, friends, relationships, people, fresh air, financial security, home, animals, being part of a community. But don't just add these words. Think of everything that you personally need, then expand on each area. You can depict this list however you want. You might, for example, choose to make it into a picture or a map. A lot of people find it really helpful to be creative. How about using colored pens or creating a collage of images taken from magazines? The only important thing though, is that you are happy with your final list. This isn't something you need to share with the world, it's about you. There's also no rush or time limit. After all these years in personal recovery, my own recovery and helping others, I still update and add to my well-being watering can exercise. So, I'm glad this is so small that you can't see my artistry. But these are my four, try and get the light right, four circles and they all interlink with each other. So then it was really hard to think about, well, what's, what's physical and a bit spiritual and what's emotional and mental at the same time. But I did actually end up with a diagram that's got my most important relationships and a cup of tea in the bit where physical, spiritual, emotional and, and men, uh, mental all overlap with each other so the core of my being is my loving relationships and a cup of tea and there's a there's a tree that's growing through almost all of it because i recharge through nature but what this exercise did for me was to make me realize how bad i am at looking after myself and how i need to try and do something about that and in one corner of this i've ended up drawing a clock because actually time i don't manage well enough to keep watering me. So I have found Julie's book to be really useful. And she finishes by inviting you to start including everything you've listed in part two into your daily life. The emphasis there is on daily. You might find it hard at first, but I promise you the rewards will be worth it, even when you can't bear to peek out from under your duvet or face the world ever again. I do want you to keep this exercise in mind. Do something from that list every day and that's about keeping watering you and i loved it i have far more fun doing it than i had thought i would have oh. and what i thought and what i discovered doing it were not the same thing it's a beautiful exercise and i really commend it to you all thanks thank julie you. thank thank you that's thank fantastic you both. that was